A compelling detective story, a cloak and dagger action and a romantic drama, all these stories were taken from real life. The history of Kazakhstan is inseparable from the world history. Reflections on history, our version. A secret beneath the clouds. The sky was getting cloudy, so it was going to rain. Otherwise, the landscape was quite idyllic. However, the locals looked at the strangers disapprovingly trying to uncover same secrets again. He says this is proof that there was a school here with children were taught to be saboteurs. It's about a top secret school of the NKVD, the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs between Medeo and Shimbalak. Did this school really exist? And who was taught there? Why do you involve children in these affairs? They aren't children, but recidivists. The film's authors claimed that the film had been based on real events. However, what had happened in real life? It said that the film has biographical features. They weren't boys. Moreover, they weren't homeless boys or criminals. It was in wartime Armata. How can we tell the truth from a writer's imagination? A battalion of the NKVD troops closed all the approaches to the school at the distance of about 400 meters. The battalion was near Gorelnik and had no idea what they protected so rigorously. From Mika and Alfred by Vladimir Kunin. Declassified documents, the search for reliable facts and the real secrets of Gorelnik are secret beneath the clouds. There's a legend or myth, to be exact, according to which saboteurs were trained at this school. Of course, they would train children, but they had to be about 15 or 18 years old. It wasn't in the USSR. It's nonsense, a legend. It's a fake. Chapter 1, A Secret School. There is a winding road and German tourists are looking at the mountains. It takes at most 10 minutes to get there from Medel by Ecobus. The driver offers to stop the bus on the bridge, which is near Goreonik. It's really impossible not to notice the plate saying its name. The all-union school for mountain training instructors under Pogrebetsky, the honored master of sports, was in Goreonik in 1943 to 46. Over 12,000 Ampan snipers and 1,500 instructors was trained there for the Red Army. It's natural that this camp wasn't located right here. It's much more difficult to find the place where the camp was situated. Nature itself guards these secrets. A mountain flood which occurred in 1973 and a severe storm which took place in 2011 changed the landscape significantly. However, this theme hardly was studied under the scandalous film was released. The late Pavel Stepanovich Bielov was a leading specialist in World War II history and we worked with him for many years. In his works, he mentioned Gorelnik as a place where military specialists were trained. According to Vladimir Vukolov, who is a scientist, mountaineer and writer, there are still a lot of questions. Why were a few mountain rifle divisions almost completely destroyed during the first months of war? Why was the Red Army defeated in the Caucasus? Why did the Gorelnik Tourist Center become a training center? Plenty of people didn't know some important facts about Kazakhstan. Everything started from a curative spring. When Alexander Bergrin, one of the most famous Almaty travelers, heard about it from shepherds, he decided to build a mountain shelter. Another famous traveler secured money for an allocation to actively help Bergrin establish the tourist center. We can say that Alibi Jangilin played a historical role. A log cabin was built in Gorelnik in 1933. 
Mass mountain climbings called Alpinadas started to be organized at that time. Hundreds of Komsomol members showing great fortitude ascended the peaks. Both mountaineering and mountain tourism were closely connected with military training. It's clear that these are applied kinds of activities, as we say. A lot of Almata mountain climbers were trained during the Alpiniads. There had been 19 mountain rifle divisions in the Soviet army by the beginning of World War II. The difference between them and ordinary rifle ones wasn't significant. The regiments were divided into companies and they used pack animals as other forms of transport and soldiers wore Panama hats instead of service caps. Of course, military training was done too, but not high in the mountains. Vladimir Vukolov's father served in one of these divisions. I saw a photo of my father wearing a Panama in the family archive. I still have this photo. He wrote there, Iranian campaign, June the 22nd, 1941, in pencil. As for the Wehrmacht command, they thought that a German soldier had to be able to fight anywhere. Everything, including their uniform, equipment, arms and maps, had to be prepared for this purpose. Training of special mountain units, for example, the Edelweiss Division, started long before World War II. Of course, these elite units were approximately in the second rank of mountain climbers. It depended on the training of this division. Hitler came to power in 1933. He used the in-tourist bureau to let the whole Edelweiss division pass as tourists. The best maps I used in the Caucasus were the German maps of 42. Every one stone was marked on them. You could see our gamekeepers training in the Alps before the war began. Thousands of tourists wandered there without noticing the troops because the most important rule for a rifleman was to remain unnoticed. If you had binoculars, you could watch their tactical activities. Gamekeepers climbed inaccessible peaks like cats, stuck to sharp cornices for a second and disappeared somewhere in dark clefts without leaving a trace. An article from Coral's German magazine. Chapter 2. A Battle at the Height Everything was done very quickly in wartime. They started establishing mountain training centers in the autumn of 1941. There were 26 of them in Kazakhstan. They taught intensively. There were 180 hours of theory, and only 48 hours were given to practice. At that time, the battle for the Caucasus, the main source of oil, was almost lost. Nobody could even defend a number of passes. Only a part of a mountain rifle division was on the North Caucasian front. When the Germans attacked the Caucasus in 1942, nothing was there. All our mountain divisions died in the valley of battles in Ukraine. The Germans destroyed five or six divisions there. The Germans didn't let Alpine snipers participate in valley battles until the war ended. Those military mountain training centers, including ones in Kazakhstan, did not have well-trained personnel to send there. They lacked everything, including ropes, so they processed two tons of hemp, which was intended for making fishing nets. Mountaineers of Moscow Aviation Institute, which was evacuated in the autumn of 1941, shared their equipment, including mountain boots and ice axes. They needed professional instructors most of all. In July 1941, a group of sportsmen even contacted the Army General Staff and offered mountaineers help in training soldiers and said that they could be sent to the front line in mountain regions. However, mountaineering was not recognized as a military speciality and only a few sportsmen found themselves in mountain troops. Mountaineers are vigorous and sporty people and all of them want to war, war voluntarily. A lot of mountaineers died at the beginning of the war. Later, when the Edelweiss division started attacking the Caucasus, they realized this. There were very few Soviet specialists who could know the tactics of conducting military operations in mountains. Fortunately, Mikhail Pogrebetsky arrived here in Kazakhstan.
He's a legend of Soviet mountaineering. The head of School of Saboteurs from the Scum film, which made a sensation, was based on him. Though they didn't have anything in common with the character, he never worked in the NKVD and did not have a criminal record either. Mikhail Pogrebetsky was a founder of the legendary Alpine Sniper School in Gorelnik. It wasn't a secret base. The Tuyuksu Mountaineering Camp was located above it. Probably they were trained there too, but this base was specialized. The mountains unite. When you're in a rope team, you must trust your partner completely and confide in them. Before Kunin's book was released and a film based on it came out, nothing even was said about the School of Saboteurs. It was just speculation. The frontline soldiers deny it, even saying it was true. They weren't scum, and the methods were different from the ones shown in the film. Probably the legend about the Austrians who lived in Amati before the war and taught our climbers alpine skiing will be confirmed. They were captives from the Edelweiss division in the film. Vladimir Vukolov says that there weren't any children, let alone criminals, in this story. Hundreds of documents he studied refuted the myth. Do you know what the scriptwriter and director of this film named as proof that the school had really been in existence? It was our plaque, which we'd put there in 2000. He said that it was proof that the school had really been here and children had been taught to be saboteurs. Chapter 3. A Special Mountain Unit. That plaque is commemorative. It was put there when the participants of those events, instructors teaching mountain riflemen, were still alive. The experience they gained was unique. Pay attention to the fact that there were no accidents from 43 until 46 when the school was in functioning. Even if people had died during training, they would have been considered battle casualties, that's all. Nobody would have said anything. Why weren't there any accidents? Because professionals worked there. The peak is reached. Future soldiers of the Red Army improved their conditioning during mountain treks. This is rare military footage. Kolokolnikov and Gubanov frontline mountaineers returned to their hometown for a holiday. The Alpine Sniper School was being established there, and the commander of this Turkestan district stopped them and said, it's decided, guys, I'm hiring you. Do you know what they were engaged in? They advised on the film, which was a training film. After they returned to the unit, both of them were sent to tribunal for desertion. However, according to Vladimir Vukolov, everything worked out. It was understood what had happened, and they were deprived of the Master of Sports titles. He has been gleaning information about Kazakhstan's mountaineers during World War II for many years. The special mountain units trained there. They were Pogrebetsky, Zimin, Rakimov, and Kels, one of the mountaineers who lowered the Nazi flags from the peaks of Elbrus and raised a Soviet one instead. The Germans raised those flags, and a few Alpine snipers died in these cracks on the way back, so it wasn't so easy. Although they climbed down when the weather was good, they died in the cracks. It happened at night. There were 26 Kazakhstan's mountaineers fighting in World War II and 86 instructors and school cadets. They managed to find out their names, which resounded throughout the whole Soviet Union. They were the unknown heroes of Gorelnik. Epilogue, Abwehr Commando 203. Of course, there were secret bases in the vicinity of Almaty. However, it's unlikely that homeless children were taught to be suicidal saboteurs. The point is, he confused two countries. There were no military Alpine snipers among boys in the Soviet Union, but they were among the Nazis. There was the Abwehr Commander 203 Special School, and teenagers were kidnapped from orphanages or selected in death camps. The majority of young saboteurs preferred to give in, but the experiment was still conducted. The participants' photos and reminiscences have remained. In spite of this, the myth about a Soviet secret school situated in Gorelnik was established. 
secret after. In the beginning, the author lied about being at that school, although he had never been there. Incidentally, he was a citizen of Germany where he invented all this stuff. It seems that the scandalous film has completed its mission all the same. Many people wanted to know the truth after that. As a result, the real hero's names will not be forgotten.